Chapter 6 The Heart of the Matter Meditation Teachings Good is the tamed mind. The mind that has been tamed brings true happiness. Dhammapada verse 35 Part 1 Nuts and Bolts In the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 19, the Buddha said to the bhikkhus, What can be done for his disciples by a master who seeks their welfare and has compassion and pity on them? That I have done for you, monks. There are these roots of trees. There are empty places. Meditate, monks. Do not delay, lest you later regret it. This is my message to you. A Threefold Training The Buddha declared that all of his teachings could be resolved into two categories, those revealing the nature of human suffering and those that deal with the cessation of that suffering. He taught that true liberation can only be brought about by cultivation of the Noble Eightfold Path, a comprehensive and integrated training or education of body, speech and mind. The ultimate freedom from suffering, realized through a clear vision of the true nature of things, occurs when all factors of that path are brought in unison to maturity. Formal meditation practice, that is to say, the application of specific mind training exercises, usually in the sitting or walking postures, lies at the heart of the Eightfold Path. Nevertheless, it is only truly effective as a means to liberation when cultivated in conjunction with the other path factors. This principle of the holistic nature of the path was fundamental to Luang Por Cha's meditation teachings. Luang Por preferred to speak about cultivation of the path in terms of the threefold training, a convention by which the eight constituent factors are resolved into three related spheres of practice. Sila, consisting of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Samadhi, an umbrella term for the training of the mind consisting of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And Banya, consisting of right view and right resolve. To Luang Po, Sila, Samadhi and Banya were different aspects of the same process, divided into three because, at any moment, one of them would take center stage, while the other two offered essential background support. In one analogy, he said the three combined to improve the mind as a combination of spices enhance the delicious curry. Correct practice of these three aspects of the path leads, he said, to a Dhamma practice which is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Meditation at Wat Ba Pong was fully embedded in a way of life designed to minimize the impediments to growth in Dhamma and maximize the supporting conditions. Meditators were celibate. They practiced in a forest, secluded from coarser sense impingement, under the guidance of a master and with the support of a community of like-minded friends. The emphasis on such virtues as wise shame and wise fear of consequences, sense restraint, contentment with little, patience and mindfulness in all postures, created the foundations underlying the inner transformation for which meditation practice was to be the catalyst. Given the Buddha's famous utterance, mind is the chief, mind is the forerunner of all things, it might seem sufficient for meditators to focus all their attention on the mind itself. But Luang Po disagreed with the view that simply by training the mind in meditation, appropriate actions and speech would naturally follow. It's not possible to simply train the mind, neglecting actions and speech. These things are connected. Practicing with the mind until it's smooth, refined and beautiful is similar to producing a finished wooden pillar or plank. Before you can obtain a pillar that is smooth, varnished and attractive, 
you must first go and cut a tree down. Then you must cut off the rough parts, the roots and branches, before you split it, saw it and work it. Practicing with the mind is the same as working with the tree. You have to work with the coarse things first. You have to destroy the rough parts, destroy the roots, destroy the bark and everything which is unattractive in order to obtain that which is attractive and pleasing to the eye. You have to work through the rough to reach the smooth. Restraint within voluntarily adopted boundaries for action and speech, watching over body and speech, as Lung Po would put it, also requires an inner training. Meditators must be constantly aware of whether or not the volitional impulses behind their behavior are tainted with defilement. Luang Po said that keeping Sila required catching the outlaw and making him into the village headman. The mind with the intention to transgress must be persuaded to become the mind with the intention not to transgress. You must sustain awareness at every moment and in every posture whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down. Before you perform any action, speak or engage in conversation, first establish your awareness. Practice like this until you are fluent. Practice so that you can keep abreast of what's going on in the mind. Practice to the point at which mindfulness becomes effortless and you are mindful before you act. Mindful before you speak. On the initial level of sila, samadhi manifests as the consistent, unshakable determination to refrain from breaking any of the precepts and by an unwavering mindfulness and restraint. As a result, the mind is able to reflect upon experience as right or wrong, wholesome or unwholesome. It is aware of sense experience and is able to investigate inner reactions of like and dislike to that experience. The wisdom faculty is now starting to manifest. The aspect of the mind, which identifies and chooses the good from the bad, the right from the wrong amongst all the mind objects within your field of awareness, is a nascent form of banya. The threefold training at this point is still quite coarse, but it's on the refined side of coarseness. The coconut palm absorbs the water from the earth and pulls it up through the trunk. By the time the water reaches the coconut itself, it has become clean and sweet, even though it is derived from that plain water in the ground. The coconut palm is nourished by what are essentially the coarse earth and water elements, which it absorbs and purifies, and these are transformed into something far sweeter and purer than before. In the same way, the practice of sila, samadhi and banya, in other words, magga, the path, has coarse beginnings, but as a result of training and refining the mind through meditation and reflection, it becomes increasingly subtle. Put simply, when sila, samadhi and banya mature, they form the one true path. A base of merit. Luang Po taught lay meditators that although they were unable to enjoy all the conditions conducive to meditation practice provided by monastic life, they were to give the same attention to an overall cultivation of the threefold training, one that reduced obstacles to Dhamma practice as much as possible and encouraged supporting factors. Everything began with generosity. Giving material things created a familiarity with the letting go of selfishness and possessiveness that would stand meditators in good stead when seeking to let go of increasingly subtle levels of attachment during meditation. Performing acts of generosity is a kind of toraman, that is, training the mind by countering its desires. 
He gave an example of a person with two apples who decides to give one to a friend but realizes that he wants to keep the larger one for himself. A Dhamma practitioner would overcome his selfish thoughts and give away the larger. If you dare decide to give away the big apple, you feel a twinge of grief. But once you've made the decision, the grief is gone. This is disciplining the mind in the correct way and achieving a victory over yourself. Giving dana, giving happiness to others, is a way of cleansing what is soiled within. You need a warm, kind and benevolent heart. This is something to reflect on. Generosity is the first thing that needs to be maintained in your mind. Meditators were encouraged to develop new skillful habits by recognizing and consistently turning away from the unskillful habits they had accumulated. Defilements are like a cat. If you spoil a cat, then it will come around all the time. But suppose one day it starts rubbing up against your leg and you don't feed it. It will meow angrily. But if you refuse to give it any food, within a day or two, you won't see it anymore. It's the same with defilements. If you don't follow them, then, before long, they won't come to disturb you anymore. And from then on, you'll be at peace. Make the defilements afraid of you. Don't make yourself afraid of defilements. Keeping the five precepts was a minimum requirement for those serious about making progress in Dharma practice. By not keeping them, would-be meditators made bad gamma, threatened their most important relationships, and created the conditions for regret, guilt and self-aversion that would fatally undermine their practice. When your sila is pure, when you're kind to others, and you treat them honestly, then you feel happy. There's no remorse in your mind. When, through not harming others, you feel no remorse, then you're already in a heaven realm. Physically and mentally you're at ease. Whether you eat or sleep, you feel at ease. You're happy. Happiness is born of sila. Certain actions have certain results. The abandonment of evil through keeping precepts leads, by a natural law, to the arising of goodness. Acts of generosity and a firm commitment to sila created the basic sense of well-being and self-respect necessary for progress in meditation. But it was also necessary to develop the ability to reflect upon experience. Without it, Satisfaction with those positive states of mind might inhibit rather than promote more profound spiritual development. If we're happy, we tend to get heedless. We don't want to go any further. We attach to that happiness. We like it. It's heaven and we are the deities. It's easeful and we live in blissful ignorance. So, reflect on happiness but don't be deluded by it. Reflect on the drawbacks of happiness, that it's unstable, doesn't stay with us for long, and once gone, suffering resumes and the tears return. Long Po cautioned that in the long term, meditation practices would only fulfill their potential if meditators cultivated a spirit of renunciation through reflecting on the drawbacks of all conditioned phenomena even the most refined and easeful. They had to clearly see the inadequacy of any stopgap, contingent solution to suffering. They needed to recognize that as long as even subtle defilements remained in the mind, there could be no true peace and contentment. And it was only through pursuing Dhamma practice to its conclusion that defilements could be completely eliminated. Dwelling on the necessity to follow the path to its end furnishes meditators with the enthusiasm and commitment to devote themselves to meditation through the ups and downs, the thicks and thins of practice. Without cultivating the spirit of renunciation, 
meditators tend to grasp on to the initial fruits of meditation that appear as the coarser defilements are attenuated. Rather than striving for complete liberation from all attachment, they settle for what Luang Po called the thin-skinned peace of elevated states of mind. Look deeply. What is the present state of your mind? Simply stay with that awareness. If you keep that up, you will have a foundation. You will have mindfulness and alertness, whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down. If you see anything coming up, then just let it be. Don't attach to it. Liking and disliking, pleasure and pain, doubts and faith are all just the mind commentating on and reflecting on its experience. Examine its results. Don't put labels on things. Know what they are. See everything that arises in the mind as merely a mental state, something impermanent, that, having arisen, persists for a while and then ceases. Things are merely processes. There's no self, no real separation between others and ourselves. There's nothing that should be clung to. Technique There is no specific Ajahn Chah meditation technique. For him, the important question to be asked about a particular means of training the mind was what results does it give? He accepted any method that incorporated the cultivation of mindfulness, alertness and appropriate effort that served to take a meditator beyond the hindrances and that led to a samadhi which could provide a foundation for insight into the way things are. Whatever path of meditation leads to letting go and non-attachment, he would say, is a correct method. Luang Po taught that it was important that meditators used a technique that was compatible with their character. By this, he did not mean that there was a particular technique specific to each person, the adoption of which would ensure success. A sense of affinity with a meditation method, he once described it as similar to an affinity with a particular food, would not make meditation smooth and easy but it would make it workable. An incompatible technique, with which the meditator felt no sense of connection or enthusiasm, on the other hand, could lead to discouragement and regress. Meditators should not switch from one method to another too easily. Only after persevering with a method for a reasonable period of time should they conclude whether or not to make a change. But although Luang Po acknowledged the validity of a number of methods, there were some which he emphasized. Mental cultivation, bhavana, means setting right your thoughts and opinions. Its aim is letting go. The various methods are like different kinds of fish traps. They differ in form, but ultimately they all share the same purpose. So here, although I don't insist upon a particular form of meditation, I usually teach people to focus on the word buddho, or on the breath for a sufficient period, and then to gradually deepen their knowledge and view of the way things are. Luang Po referred to mindfulness of breathing as the crown jewel of meditation techniques. He gave various reasons for encouraging its development, beginning with the observation that it is an uncomplicated practice and convenient. The breath is naturally present at all times and in all postures. It can be turned to at any moment. It can be practiced by meditators of all character types. It has been the preeminent technique since the first days of the sasana. The Buddha and many of his great disciples made use of this technique, and it has been praised by meditation masters through the ages. Luang Po himself used this method, and he asserted that through the practice of mindfulness of breathing, 
the meditator could fulfill the whole of the threefold training. Compelling the mind to focus on the breath is sila. The unremitting focus on the breath, bringing the mind to a state of lucid calm, is called samadhi. Letting go of attachment through contemplation of the focused breath as impermanent, unstable and selfless, is called banya. Therefore, the practice of mindfulness of breathing can be said to be the development of sila, samadhi and banya. Someone practicing it can be taken to be following the Eightfold Path, which the Buddha taught was the foremost, the most excellent of all paths, as it leads towards Nibbāna. If you follow in the way I've described, then that may be considered realizing the Buddha Dhamma in the most authentic possible way. Buddha In order to help meditators anchor their mind on the breath, Luang Po recommended using the mantra Bud To, mentally reciting Bud on the inhalation and To on the exhalation. Bud To is the nominative case of the word usually expressed in the vocative as Buddha. The long O provided by this form of the word Bud To is more easily sustained for the duration of an exhalation than the short A as in the word Buddha. Inner recitation of Buddha can also be practiced without reference to the breath. As one meaning of the word Buddha or Buddha is the undiluted knowing of the way things are, meditators employing this method are essentially repeating again and again the name of the awareness they are seeking to cultivate occasionally returning to the meaning of the mantra during meditation prevents the practice from becoming mechanical. Meditate reciting Buddha, Buddha, until it penetrates deep into your heart. The word Buddha represents the awareness and wisdom of the Buddha. In practice, you must depend on this word more than anything else. The awareness it brings will lead you to understand the truth about your own mind. It is a true refuge as it includes both mindfulness and insight. When your mind is consciously applied to an object, it wakes up. The awareness wakes it up. Once this knowing has arisen through meditation, you can see the mind clearly. As long as the mind remains without awareness of Buddha, even if there is an ordinary worldly presence of mind, it will not lead you to what is truly beneficial. Sati, or mindfulness, depends on the presence of Buddha, the knowing. It must be a clear knowing, which leads to the mind becoming brighter and more radiant. The illuminating effect that this clear knowing has on the mind is similar to the brightness of a light in a darkened room. As long as the room is pitch black, any objects placed inside it remain difficult to distinguish or else completely obscured from view. But as you begin intensifying the brightness of the light inside, it will penetrate throughout the whole room enabling you to see more clearly from moment to moment, thus allowing you to know more and more the details of any object inside. When the knowing of the breath had become clear and stable, when what he called the Buddha knowing had become established, Luang Po said that the mantra could be discarded. It had served its purpose. Meditators who felt no affinity with breath meditation at all were encouraged to cultivate more discursive meditations, making use of directed thought such as the recollection of death or contemplation of the body, specifically the five basic meditation topics of head hair, body hair, nails, teeth and skin. In the latter, meditators could focus on the unattractive, the asuba, aspects of these body parts, 
or on their empty, impermanent nature by considering them in terms of their constituent elements of earth, hardness, water, cohesion or fluidity, fire, heat, and air, motion. Pali names for the five body parts, Gesa, Loma, Nakka, Danta, Tatcho, could be internally recited as mantras to keep the mind on track. Visualization could be employed to enhance the contemplation. Luang Po would encourage monastics cultivating mindfulness of breathing as their main practice to develop meditation on the body as an auxiliary technique. He reminded them that its importance could be seen from the fact that it was included in the novice ordination ceremony. Furthermore, as the first level of liberation, stream entry, was reached by the abandonment of Sakkaya Ditti, or personality view, and the identification with the physical body constituted the most powerful and immediate expression of that fetter, then body contemplation was of immense value. You must repeatedly investigate the body and break it down into its component parts. As you see each part as it truly is, the perception of the body being a solid entity or self is gradually eroded away. You have to keep putting continuous effort into this investigation of the truth without pause. Practice contemplating the body as being just that much, until it's quite natural to think to yourself, Oh, the body is merely the body. It's just that much. Once this way of reflection is established, as soon as you say to yourself that it's just that much, the mind lets go. There is letting go of attachment to the body. There is the insight that sees the body as merely the body. By sustaining this sense of detachment through continuous seeing of the body as merely a body, all doubt and uncertainty is gradually uprooted. As you investigate the body, the more clearly you see it as just a body rather than as a person, a being, a me, or a he, or a she. The Single Chair Meditation practices that involve directing the thinking mind rather than turning away from it are based on the principle that sustaining an unbroken stream of awareness on a theme of contemplation instead of a physical sensation can also lead to a gathering of the mind's forces. This produces a rapture that takes the mind beyond the pull of worldly thoughts and desires to a samadhi that provides the platform for the profound work of wisdom. But whatever meditation practice was adopted, Luang Po emphasized that mindfulness must play a central role. He compared watching the mind with mindfulness and alertness to a shopkeeper keeping a sharp eye on his goods when a group of mischievous children come into his shop. In another simile, he said that the mind is like a room with a single chair. When mindfulness sits firmly on that seat facing the door, then any guest entering the room is immediately known. Without a chair to sit on, no guest stays for long. Mindfulness, bolstered by confidence in the Buddha's path to liberation and by right effort, resulted in a samadhi that bore within it the seeds of wisdom and liberation. Mindfulness is the nurse and protector of samadhi. It is the dhamma which allows all other wholesome dhammas to arise in balance and harmony. Mindfulness is life. At any moment that you lack mindfulness, it's as if you are dead. Lack of mindfulness is called heedlessness, and it robs your words and actions of all meaning. Whatever form of recollection mindfulness takes, it gives rise to self-awareness, wisdom, all kinds of good qualities. Any Dhamma which lacks mindfulness is incomplete. 
Mindfulness is what governs standing, walking, sitting and lying down. It's not only during sitting meditation that mindfulness is required. Outside of formal meditation periods, you must have a constant mindfulness and alertness and give care and attention to your actions. If you do that, a sense of wise shame will arise. You'll feel ashamed of improper actions or speech. As the sense of shame becomes stronger, then so will restraint. With strong restraint, there is no heedlessness. Wherever you go, mindfulness must be present. The Buddha said, practice mindfulness a great deal, develop it a great deal. Mindfulness is the Dhamma that will guard over your past and present actions and those that you are about to perform. It is of great benefit to you. Know yourself at every moment and then you will have a constant sense of right and wrong. That awareness of rightness or wrongness of everything that occurs in your mind will arouse a sense of wise shame and you will refrain from acting in bad or mistaken ways. A Meditation Instruction Attention to the finer details of the sitting posture has never been a prominent feature of the Theravada meditation tradition. Very few forest monks sit in full lotus with each foot upturned on the opposite thigh or fold their hands in a perfect mudra, for example with the hands folded in the lap and each thumb lightly touching. The basic instructions are simply to establish a posture that is stable and erect, with the main criterion being that the posture be one in which the meditator can sit for a reasonably long time with the minimum of unnecessary discomfort. Lung Por treated posture as a straightforward matter. Meditators generally sat flat on the floor. Lung Por did not, however, object to the introduction of meditation cushions at Wat Banana Chan the branch monastery he established for his Western disciples. At the beginning of a meditation session, he would simply give instructions to take the cross-legged posture, place the right leg on the left, the right hand on the left, keep the back straight, make oneself comfortable, not too tense and not too relaxed, and close the eyes. The preference for right over left here is simply a tradition that has been passed down from forest monks of previous generations. Conceivably, it originated in some consideration of internal energy flows, but Lung Po never spoke in such terms. Having paid homage to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, meditators either turned to their main meditation object or began with a preliminary practice. Lung Po sometimes suggested going through the 32 parts of the body before turning to the breath. Apart from being a good mindfulness practice in itself, this reinforced skillful perceptions of the body that could then be taken up for deeper investigation when the mind had been strengthened by samadhi. Lung Po also taught less experienced meditators to follow the breath in and out of the body for a certain period before focusing on one particular point, such as the tip of the nose. Focus your mindfulness, so that it follows the breath entering your body and leaving it. Follow the beginning of the breath, the middle of the breath, the end of the breath. With mindfulness, keep the breath in mind, and with alertness, be aware that right now, you are breathing. On the inhalation, the beginning of the breath is at the nose tip, the middle at the heart, and the end at the abdomen. On the exhalation, the beginning of the breath lies at the abdomen, the middle at the heart, and the end at the tip of the nose. Focus on these three points. The mind your awareness has no time to sneak off and take hold of other objects because it's preoccupied with being aware right here of both the inhalation 
and the exhalation. If the mind goes off in search of other objects, it shows that mindfulness has slipped. Establish it again. Be aware of exactly where the breath is passing at each moment. Keep looking. Sometimes your mind runs off for a long time without you being aware of it. Suddenly you realize that mindfulness has been lost again. Start afresh. If you practice in this way, then you will develop a good working knowledge of the beginning, middle and end of the breath. After you've trained in this way for a sufficient time, mindfulness will be constantly present on the inhalation and the exhalation. There will be mindfulness at the beginning of the breath, its middle and end. Initially, you will have a few difficulties, but later, as you become more experienced, it will no longer be necessary to follow the breath in and out. Now, anchor the awareness at the tip of your nose. Stop right there and note whether the breath is long or short. Be aware of the inhalation and the exhalation at that point. When you first start to try practice sitting meditation, give this method a try. When you're concentrating on the breath, there's no need to force it. It's similar to learning how to use a pedal sewing machine. To sew properly, you need to find a rhythm between your hand and foot. So when you're first learning to use a sewing machine, what do you do? You practice pedaling freely without sewing anything. Once you can pedal fluently, then you start on some cloth. Your breath is the same. There's no need to make it a certain way. It doesn't matter whether it's long or short, provided that it feels comfortable. If the breath is too long or too short or too strong, don't force it. Allow it to find its own balance. All you have to do is focus on the inhalation and the exhalation. You don't have to contemplate anything else. It's enough to be aware of the breath. When you do this, certain thoughts will arise. What's the use of this and so on? Keep going. Don't get caught in doubts. There's no need to answer them. There's no need to think. It's not your job. Your job is simply to be aware of the breath as it enters and leaves the body. You don't want to see deities or Brahma gods, but you want to see the breath. It's sufficient merely that you don't forget the breath. Understand and then cut off the various objects that pass in and out of awareness and let them go. Thoughts and moods are changeful. Perhaps when you start sitting, you begin to feel homesick and the mind starts proliferating about this matter and that. The moment you start thinking of home, then remind yourself, it's changeful, my nair. Fond thoughts of home are impermanent and so are negative ones. You can't believe any of it. Your mind lies to you. You have to assert this changeful nature of things. Sometimes you hate this person and that, but it doesn't last. Sometimes you love this person and that, but it doesn't last either. Pin the mind down right there, and where can it go? When you hate someone, you fabricate a certain image of them. When you love someone, you do the same. The mind starts to suffer. Sometimes you may detest someone so much that whenever you think of them, tears of fury start to flow. Do you see what I mean? How could that be real and lasting? 
see mental states as merely mental states. All of them are impermanent. We have to cut things off, because they will delude us if we don't. We perceive something as good, and we remind ourselves that the good is changeful. Something else is experienced as bad, and that is changeful too. Don't let your mind grasp onto the good. Don't let it grasp onto the bad. If you have the measure of mental states in this way, then they lose their significance. Just keep working away at it. The states that arise, good or bad, have no intrinsic value, and they will gradually fade away. If you follow them and keep an eye on them, you're bound to see this truth of changefulness. Your initial practice has to be like this. Be mindful. Subsequently, you will see the breath, mindfulness and the mind simultaneously at one point. The word see here doesn't refer to ordinary vision. It's a seeing with awareness by the internal, not the external eye. The awareness of the breath is here. Mindfulness is here. The sense of knowing, the mind, is here. They converge in one harmonious whole. When we see that harmony, the mind will detach from sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, worry and agitation, and indecision. These five hindrances will be gone completely. All that you will see is the breath, there will be just mindfulness and the mind in one point. With the absence of the five hindrances, you can take it that the mind has entered samadhi. You must know when the breath is coarse and when it's fine, and you have to know right there. After that, you must focus on the breath to make it more and more subtle and fine until its coarseness has disappeared. The refinement of the breath is such that as you sit and contemplate the breath, it becomes so subtle that there is almost no breath. Or so it seems. Don't be alarmed. The breath is still there. It's just that it's extremely subtle. So, what do you do then? You must use your mindfulness to make the absence of breath your meditation object. At this point, some people may become alarmed, afraid that their breathing will stop and that it's dangerous. You must reassure yourself that it's quite safe and that there's no danger. All that is necessary is that you maintain mindfulness, the awareness, the knowing. The mind is now in a very subtle state. At this level, it doesn't have to be controlled. You don't have to do anything. All that is needed is to maintain mindfulness and alertness. You should be aware that at that moment the mind is acting automatically. It's not necessary to adjust its quality. Now, Simply maintain a steady mindfulness and alertness. The mind has fully entered a state of lucid calm. Sometimes the mind will enter and leave this state at short intervals. Sometimes, when it has withdrawn, it will become lucidly calm again for a short time. And then it will emerge once more and become aware of sense objects. The mind having withdrawn from samadhi, comprehends the nature of various things that arise in awareness. There will be a rapture in the Dhamma. Wisdom will arise. Many kinds of knowledge will arise at this point. The mind, at this moment, will have entered the stage of vipassana. You must firmly establish mindfulness, concentration and alertness. When wisdom arises, the mind is in vipassana, which is a continuation of samatha. This is called the process of the mind. 
you must attain mastery in entering and leaving states of tranquility. When you have done so, then you will know the nature of the states of mind and the nature of the mind that withdraws. You must be astute in entering and leaving samadhi, establishing a strong degree of mindfulness and alertness at these points. Here, the mind has come to an end of turmoil. Whether it's moving forwards or back, all the states of mind lie within the lucid calm. On reaching the appropriate time for the meditation to end, review what you did before you entered samadhi. How did you establish your mind so as to be so peaceful? Then, the next time you sit, you must consider the first thing to do. Recall how you focused your mind when you withdrew from samadhi. You must know this. Although you have ended your sitting meditation, you should not look on it as an end to samadhi. You should be determined to continue being aware and focused and mindful, whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down. You must be constantly mindful. An aside. The meditation instruction in the previous section is long and detailed. It includes a number of technical terms and references to some advanced levels of practice and subtle states of mind. However, it should be borne in mind that this instruction was not intended by Luang Po to be a definitive account of the meditation process. The text is a transcription of one particular instruction given on one particular day to one particular group of monastics. Luang Po did not write a meditation manual, and he rarely spoke about more advanced levels of practice in public. For this reason, some of his views on meditation practice will always remain obscure. And this is also true about his advice on more basic matters. In an earlier section, dealing with the choice of a meditation technique, the statement is made that meditators should stick with the practice for a reasonable period of time before deciding to change it. But how long is a reasonable time? Certainly a reasonable question, but not, unfortunately, one that can be answered with words from Luang Po's mouth. A period of time measured in weeks or months rather than hours or minutes, would be the answer that he would probably, but did not, actually give. Accurately conveying Luang Po's meditation teachings is thus somewhat hampered by the unevenness of the body of recorded evidence. Some topics are well covered, others not so well at all. Complications are also caused by the fact that the material that is available is transcribed from instructions given ad hoc and which are reflective of time, place, and audience. Luang Po's response to questions about the importance of the cultivation of jhana, absorption, for example, varied according to the character and accumulated foundational virtues of the questioner. In other words, if he saw meditators had a well-developed capacity for jhana, he would encourage it, and it would appear that he considered this the superior path. But if he saw meditators had only a weak capacity, or were getting caught up in the trap of craving for jhana, he might de-emphasize it. If he saw that meditators possessed strong powers of analysis, he might encourage them to make use of those powers when the mind had gone beyond the hindrances, without waiting for the stabilization of mind provided by jhana. In this, his teaching paralleled that of his great contemporary, Lung Ta Mahabua, who coined the phrase, Banya cultivating samadhi. Another problem is encountered in translating the transcribed records of Lung Po's meditation teachings, and it springs from the nature of the Thai language. Thai lends itself much more to flexible ambiguity than to scientific precision. For example, 
it insists much less on the use of third-person pronouns than is the case in English. Questions of who or what are acting upon whom or what can be hard to determine with any great degree of certainty. In matters dealing with the physical world, context often comes to the translator's rescue. In matters dealing with the more profound functions of the mind, the translator is rarely so fortunate. One last layer of difficulty is furnished by the occasionally idiosyncratic manner in which Luang Po and his contemporaries in the Isan forest tradition use Pali technical terms. For readers coming from a more academic Theravada background, this can be a source of frustration. For a translator, it may involve being faced with passages in which the meaning ascribed to a term by the teacher does not correspond exactly to the definition in a Pali English dictionary. One way to look at this discrepancy is by means of an analogy. If the suttas might be compared with a photograph of the nature of things, then the teachings of the great masters would be like paintings. In their attempt to bring out their sense of what is before them, painters sometimes slightly manipulate forms or use colors not recognized by the camera. Their intention is to transmit the truth of their experience to the best of their abilities. Similarly, the great forest masters of Isan have, on occasion, put fidelity to the Dhamma that they have realized above a strict fidelity to the texts. To summarize, the meditation teachings of Luang Po represented in this chapter contain many gems and useful reflections. But, for the reasons given above, they do not coalesce into a complete system. If Luang Po were alive today and speaking to a student of his teachings, he would perhaps give the following advice. Attention to detail is good. Precision and clarity are good. But always be willing to tolerate a certain element of incompleteness and ambiguity. Not just sitting. Many Wat Pa Pong monastics practice walking meditation as much as or more than sitting meditation. The Pali is Jankama, and in Thai it's called Jongkrom. The Buddha listed its benefits as producing a strong constitution, good digestion, physical endurance, and a readiness to strive. Most importantly, he said that the samadhi arising during walking meditation is more easily sustained outside formal practice sessions than that developed while sitting. Walking meditation provides both an alternative and a complement to sitting meditation. It is a good substitute for sitting meditation when physical ailments make sitting impractical or when hindrances that arise strongly during sitting are more manageable or absent while walking. Walking tends to be the best choice following a meal, for example, when mental dullness is likely to make sitting meditation difficult. Walking complements sitting by requiring cultivation of mindfulness in movement rather than stillness. Although the meditator walks with eyes downcast, the consciousness of forms and sounds, together with the rhythm of walking, prevents the meditator from becoming detached from the world of the senses in the same way that is possible during sitting meditation. As a result, it is often more difficult to pacify the mind while walking, but once the mind has become calm, the experience of varying sense data combined with the regular physical movements of the posture, is conducive to the development of wisdom. The thoughts that arise from the calmness become Dhamma Vichaya, the investigation of Dhamma. In Thai forest monasteries like Wat Ba Pong, every kutti has its own walking path, usually from 20 to 30 paces long. Luang Po recommended walking at a more or less normal pace in order to develop a habit of awareness easily integrated into daily life. Hands were to be clasped in front of the abdomen, never behind the back, a style which Luang Po said was more suited to that of a general inspecting the troops than a monk. 
and most definitely, the arms were not to be left hanging loosely by one side. In addition to being perceived to be unsightly, walking without clasping the hands together was considered too relaxed to promote inner restraint. Walking in such a way was too similar to leisurely strolling to be appropriate for meditation. Lung Por instructed that before beginning the session, meditators should stand and pay homage to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha in the manner they saw fit and clarify their intention for the following session. Then, they should begin to walk back and forth along a path, maintaining a constant mindfulness and alertness as they walked. One method by which this was to be achieved, Lung Por would advise, was through the use of the mantra Bud To, mentally reciting Bud as the right foot touches the ground and To as the left foot touches. This was the basic means of stilling the mind. Maintain a continuous awareness on the object. If your mind becomes agitated or you get weary, then stop and still the mind. Ease it by focusing on the breath. When the mind has become sufficiently calm, then resume the walking meditation. Keep a constant alertness. Establish awareness at the beginning of the path. Be aware of it all. The beginning of the path, the middle of the path, the end of the path. Keep the awareness unbroken while you are walking. Sometimes, a feeling of panic or fear may arise. Go against it, it's changeful. Courage arises, and that doesn't last either. It's all changeful. There's nothing to grasp onto. This gives rise to wisdom. Bringing forth wisdom doesn't refer to a knowledge based on memory. It means knowing the mind that thinks and perceives. All thoughts and perceptions arise in our minds. Good or bad, right or wrong, just acknowledge their presence. Don't give them any undue significance. Suffering is just suffering. Happiness is just happiness. It's all a fraud. Hold your ground. Don't go chasing after them. Don't chase after happiness and don't chase after suffering. Know them. Know them and then put them down. Wisdom will arise. Keep going against the stream of the mind. When you feel sufficiently tired, then stop and come off the walking path. But be careful to maintain the continuity of mindfulness. Standing, walking, sitting or lying down. Maintain a constant awareness. Whether you're walking to the village on arms round, walking through the village receiving food, eating the food or whatever, be mindful at all times in every posture. Luang Po recommended that meditators not follow their first thought to end a walking meditation session. He said that after deciding to leave their walking path, they should continue walking for at least a few more minutes. Sometimes, the feeling that it was time to change posture would pass away by itself and the meditation could be extended. If not, and it was indeed a good time to stop, then, a wise habit of not reacting immediately to the impulses of a mind that might well be tainted by defilement had been strengthened. Lung Por taught that effort had to be sustained from the first moment of consciousness in the early morning until the last moment before sleep in every posture. When you lie down, then lie on your right side, with your left foot resting on the right. Concentrate on put to, put to, until you fall asleep. This is what is called lying down with mindfulness. On one occasion, he maintained that an adept practitioner could remember whether he fell asleep on the inhalation or the exhalation. Whether meditating while walking, sitting, standing or lying down, 
the daily practice was to re-establish balance as soon as it was lost. Meditators were to be patient and persevering, allowing the mind to become discouraged or irritated when it refused to stay on its object would only compound the problem. Taming the mind was like taming a wild animal. If you didn't give up, then sooner or later the animal was sure to. In another of his favorite animal similes, he compared the practice to herding a water buffalo. Your mind is like a water buffalo. Mental states are like rice plants. The knowing is like the owner. What do you do when you graze a buffalo? You let it go on its way, but you keep an eye on it. If it goes close to the rice plants, then you yell at it. When the buffalo hears you, it moves away. But you can't afford to let your attention wander. If it's stubborn and won't obey you, then you have to get a stick and give it a thrashing. 